we have talked so far about how RNA viruses make more genomes. Today we're going to look at DNA viruses, how they make more DNA genomes, viral DNA replication. And we're going to look at the Baltimore scheme again, which I presume by now you have committed to memory. So today we're going to talk about DNA viruses of the class of the family's parvoviruses. These have single-stranded DNAs. And of course, as you know, they have to get double-stranded before you can make message from them. We're going to talk about um, viruses with double-stranded DNA genomes, where they can go directly to mRNA. Uh, we're not going to be talking about the gapped hepatitis B viruses. We'll save that for another lecture. So among these double-stranded DNA viruses are the adeno and herpes viruses, the polyoma viruses, uh, and the related papillomas, and then a little bit about pox viruses. Now, retroviruses also produce a double-stranded DNA, which integrates into our chromosomal DNA, and that gets replicated as chromosomes replicate. And we'll have more to say about that uh, after the exam, but basically the principles of DNA replication apply to that DNA as well. Now, a few basic fundamentals about DNA replication, just as we did for RNA. A lot of these are very similar. Uh, you have a template, of course, shown on the top as a black line. It is read in a three to five prime direction by the polymerase, and the, the product is synthesized in a five to three prime directed. So the DNA is made by template directed incorporation. That means you need a template and you incorporate DNTPs into the three prime end of a DNA. It's always synthesized five to three prime, and it's always by semi-conservative replication. That is, you make two daughter strands. You, do, you open up the duplex and you make a daughter strand on each. And this is very important, this next one. Replication initiates at very specific sites on the DNA template called origins or ORI, O-R-I, or origins of replication. We're going to talk about this a lot today because we know a lot about them from viruses. The synthesis is catalyzed by an enzyme called DNA-dependent DNA polymerase, but it cannot do it by itself. It needs other proteins. It needs a lot of proteins, as you will see today. And DNA synthesis is always primer-dependent. So it's different from RNA synthesis, which can be primer dependent, or sometimes it doesn't need a primer. DNA synthesis always requires a primer. The way the nucleoside triphosphate is incorporated is very much like we talked about for RNA. It, it, it goes by a two-metal mechanism of catalysis. And here again, is we showed you this uh, for the RNA talk, but I'll show you again to remind you, here's the template DNA and NTPs, DNTPs are added based on the nature of the base in the template. And here we're adding a T to, to base pair with this A. And these, these come in, of course, as triphosphates. You have a sugar, you have a base, and then you have one, two, three phosphates. So this would be TTP, for example. And then two magnesiums are coordinated by two aspartate residues in the polymerase, and the magnesium assists in the transesterification reactions that occur to get rid of the two phosphates and join this phosphate to the oxygen in the previous base. And this, these conserved magnesiums, if you remember for RNA polymerase on the lower left, this is a three-dimensional structure of the poliovirus RNA polymerase. Uh, the two metal coordinating aspartates are shown as these yellow stick figures on this yellow colored beta strand. This is the catalytic center of the enzyme. Uh, and this is where new bases are added to the growing strand. Now on top of this is a three-dimensional structure of a DNA polymerase. And it has the same overall shape. It looks like a right hand with palm, fingers, and thumb domain. The palm domain has the active site. And you can see I've, I've drawn in yellow in the DNA polymerase the active site. And that corresponds to the same structure as in the RNA polymerase. And in fact, the two aspartates are present in that yellow uh, the beta strands there. So catalysis, the mechanism of catalysis is conserved, which suggests that these enzymes and the, other, the others as well besides these two all evolved from a, a common 
precursor many, many years ago. Now, all the viruses we're going to talk about and all the viruses that we know about need something from the host in order to carry out DNA synthesis. None of them can do it entirely on their own. And the degree to which they are independent of the host with respect to DNA synthesis depends on the size of the viral genome. When viral genomes come into the cell, in order to replicate, they all have to make at least one protein. And that goes uh, without saying. And this is why DNA synthesis is delayed. If you remember when we talked about transcriptional cascades, the purpose of those cascades is to delay proteins until structural proteins, until you get DNA synthesis going. And so you can't just start making DNA immediately. You have to make at least one viral protein, sometimes more, depending again on the virus. So simple viruses with small genomes require many host proteins in order to replicate DNA because their genome is too small to encode a polymerase and other accessory proteins. They do have to encode at least one protein, though, to orchestrate the host, if you will. They have to control things. And what we mean by that will become very obvious in a few moments. Bigger viruses, the adeno, herpes, and pox viruses, which are shown here, have encode more proteins involved in DNA replication. They encode the polymerase, and ancillary proteins, but no virus encodes everything. For pox viruses, for example, have a, encode a lot of proteins that participate in DNA replication, but they can't make all the triphosphates. So the ATP, uh, TTP, CTP, and GTP that are needed are mainly made by host enzymes for most viruses. Uh, pox viruses can make a few of those, but not all of them. So every DNA virus is dependent on the host for some aspect of DNA synthesis. Now this may change in the future as we discover these giant viruses. Who knows, maybe some of them can encode the total DNA replication system. But as far as we know, not every protein that you need for replication is encoded in the genome. So by that I mean not just the polymerase, but proteins that act with the polymerase, as you'll see, as DNA is replicated, and all the enzymes you need to make the triphosphate precursors. All those are needed for DNA synthesis. So where does the polymerase come from? Well, the small DNA viruses, as I said, their genome is too small to encode a DNA polymerase, so they don't do that. And these are papillomaviruses. Uh, these are viruses that we'll be talking about more. These cause warts, and they can also cause anogenital cancers. Polyomaviruses like SV40 and parvoviruses, these are the small DNA viruses. They don't encode a polymerase, but they do encode a protein that orchestrates the host, at least one. Large DNA viruses, as I've said, encode a lot of the replication system. In, in the case of pox virus, they encode most of it, but again, not all. Pox viruses don't encode the whole thing. They can't replicate DNA without the help of the cell. Herpes viruses, adenovirus, and pox viruses are among these bigger uh, viruses. They, they do encode a DNA polymerase, but they do not encode everything that you need. So what kinds of viral proteins are encoded that help or participate in, in DNA synthesis? Of course, the polymerase itself by some viruses, accessory proteins uh, like helicases and processivity factors. We'll look at these in a moment. Origin binding proteins. These are proteins that bind the origin of replication and favor viral DNA replication. Exonucleases and, as I've mentioned, enzyme of nucleic acid metabolism. And these are the enzymes that make the triphosphates. As you may remember from biochem, or maybe you don't want to remember because you hated it, there are very specific pathways for the synthesis of these nucleotides, nucleoside triphosphates. And some viruses encode some of the enzymes like thymidine kinase and ribonucleotide reductase. But as, as I said, even pox viruses, which encode more DNA synthesizing enzymes and any virus we know about don't encode them all. Which statement about viral <coughs> DNA synthesis is not correct? One, large DNA viruses encode many proteins involved in DNA synthesis. Two, small DNA viruses encode at least one protein involved in DNA synthesis. 
Three, viral DNA replication is always delayed after infection because it requires the synthesis of at least one viral protein. And four, some viruses encode all proteins needed for DNA replication. All right, 92% of you answered D. Some viruses encode all proteins needed for DNA replication. But some of you uh, pick the others. Large DNA viruses encode many proteins involved in DNA. That, that's correct, so you wouldn't want to get it wrong. Small viruses encode at least one protein. That's correct. And DNA replication is always delayed. That's also correct, because you have to make at least one viral protein either the one that orchestrates the host or the polymerase itself or, or something else. The viruses that we're going to talk about that have to replicate their genomes, they have diverse genome structures. So one of the things we have to deal with is how this is accomplished. We're going to talk about parvoviruses where the genome is single-stranded and it has these funny hairpins at either end. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about viruses with circular double-stranded DNA molecules and, and viruses with linear double-stranded molecules like adenovirus, herpes simplex, and then the pox viruses, which are also linear double-stranded, except their ends are covalently linked. Uh, the five and three prime ends are covalently joined. So how does the DNA replication system deal with all of this? Let's, we're gonna, that's one of the themes we'll look at. Now in general, among the viruses that we talk about, and they're all listed here, there are two kinds of replication schemes for the DNA. On the left, is one that employs what we call a replication fork. And you've probably learned about this if you took biology or biochemistry, because this is what they teach you when they teach you how cells replicate their DNA. You have, of course, a double-stranded DNA here. Uh, and on one strand, the strand is read three prime to five prime. And you lay down an RNA primer. And then you continuously produce the complementary strand the synthesis occurs in a five to three prime direction. So as this fork separates, that strand can keep going. That's continuous synthesis on that strand. The other strand is in the opposite direction. So the polymerase can't go in the same way. It has to go the other way. And it can only make short pieces as the fork opens. So when more single strand is exposed, uh, then the polymerase will make pieces. These are also primed uh, with RNA. So the replication fork is characterized by RNA primers, and this is done by the small DNA viruses, herpes viruses, and the proviruses of retroviruses. And that's because they do it the way our chromosomal DNA does it, and that's by a replication fork. Okay? Now on the right is the other mechanism, which you may not have seen if you've never studied virology, and this is strand displacement. Uh, and here we, we're going to talk about this for adenoviruses parvo and pox viruses. <clears throat> These are never RNA primed because the viruses have evolved a different way to prime DNA synthesis. Remember, you always need a primer for DNA synthesis. And so these viruses have evolved ways without an RNA. And some of the different ways which we'll look at is a protein primer and DNA hairpin primers. And we call it strand displacement because uh, we're copying one strand and the other strand is being displaced. That will eventually be replicated as well. Remember, this is semi-conservative replication, so both strands are replicated. Uh, but it doesn't get replicated at the same time as occurs in the replication fork. All right, now, uh, when we talk about <coughs> deep prime DNA synthesis, we have an issue that you have to solve, and that's called the 5 prime end problem. And it's illustrated here. If you have a a linear DNA template, and let's say it's single-stranded for simplicity. You want to make a copy, a DNA copy. You have to make RNA primers along its length. Hey, remember, you want to copy the whole thing. So the RNA primers are put down, then the polymerase comes in and elongates. Those are the red sequences here. But you can't leave RNA in there, right? You need to get rid of the RNA and replace it with DNA. That's what happens in uh, the replication forks. And you can see that that works for most of the molecule except at the five prime end. You have a piece missing because you took out the primer, but the polymerase 
needs an RNA primer to fill that in, so you can't fill it in. So this is an issue. Um, this is why we have telomeres on our chromosomes, but viruses don't have telomeres. They've solved this issue in a number of different ways, and that's a theme that I want you to pay attention to as we talk about this today. Now, basically, when you take a biochem course and they teach you about DNA replication of your chromosomes, they're telling you what we know from SV40 DNA. This was the first DNA whose replication was studied. It's small. It's, you could easily purify a ton of it. And we figured out DNA replication using this molecule. So this is a circular, double-stranded DNA virus. It has a single origin of replication. That means that's where DNA replication begins. Single origin of replication. And we can look at this molecule replicating in vitro and see how that origin works. We know, for example, that DNA polymerase begins at the origin and then it proceeds bidirectionally. So you have two polymerases operating on the same molecule, one over here on the right, one over here on the left. Okay, so we have a rep two replication forks. So that should tell you right away that this is going to be primed by RNA. They move apart from each other. And we can see that in the electron microscope because you can cut this DNA with a restriction enzyme. You can cut it once and linearize it. So here's a linear SV40 molecule. And you can see the origin of replication right there. There's a little bubble because replication has just begun. And in the progressive images, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And by measuring how far the ends are, you can tell that the DNA polymerases are moving in both directions. It's, it's bidirectional replication. All right, so this shows you what an origin of replication is, the place where DNA replication begins. So here's a schematic of the SV40 origin. Here's the origin, and we've already replicated uh, a bit, so now we have two forks, bless you, moving in each direction. And again, because this is um, a replication fork, we're going to have a leading and a lagging strand. The leading strand is easy. The polymerase can keep chugging along and synthesize in a five to three prime direction. Using RNA primers, those are shown in green. And as the bubble gets bigger or the fork opens up, the DNA is melted. This can simply keep synthesizing. And on the other strand, the same thing. There's a leading strand as well. But of course, on the, on, on, in this direction, the polymerase can't on this top strand can't go in that direction, it has to go backwards, and it can only make short pieces because the, the fork is limiting it. So you have lagging strands on, on both sides as well. And those are all primed by uh, RNA primers. The fact that this <coughs> molecule is circular gets rid of the end problem. It's easy, there are no ends. <laughs> the molecule, when you, when you reach uh, the other side of the circle, the RNA is excised and the polymerase uses the three prime end of the new strand to simply fill it in. It uses that as a primer. So again, it, the, the five prime end issue is, is shown again here. I showed you this before. What happens at the end of the molecules? Since there's no end on the SV40 DNA, the last bit of DNA simply fill, is used to fill in where the last RNA was. Beautiful uh, solution. Circular DNA does it. Now, we don't have circular DNA, so we have other solutions to this end problem. Now, in the version of the slides I gave you, this three prime it was, was in the wrong place. It was at the five prime end of this new strand, which is incorrect. The artist uh, did it incorrectly, so I've placed it correctly right here. This three prime indicates the three prime end of each of the RNA, uh, each of the newly synthesized uh, DNAs. How does this work? So it begins at the origin of replication. The viral DNA comes into a cell, has to get in the nucleus, because that's where DNA replication occurs. All the viruses we're going to talk about, with one exception, pox virus, the DNA replication happens in the nucleus. Okay, so SV40 goes in the nucleus, has to make a protein. So that DNA is transcribed. We talked about transcription last time. The mRNAs go out into the cytoplasm, and a single protein is made, T antigen, which is an origin binding protein that's going to co opt the DNA synthesis system of the cell so it copies the viral DNA. So here's large T, this uh, orange uh, rectangular protein here. It, it forms hexamers, and two hexamers bind at either side of the origin of replication. 
and it basically denatures the origin as shown here and it attracts other cellular proteins in that start replication including a topoisomerase to help unwind and as you'll see later uh, here, here's a single stranded DNA binding protein that will bind the single strands to make sure they stay apart so the polymerase can go in and copy. Basically large T gets everything going. Okay, large T is essential for attracting the cellular polymerase apparatus to the origin. Otherwise, the virus would have a hard time getting its DNA replicated. It would have to wait for polymerases to bump into the origin, which is a low frequency event. So having an origin binding protein like large T is the key. And that's why it's made first. Now this origin binding protein uh, opens up the replication forks the, at the origin. Other proteins come in, for example, you don't need to know these, but I just want you to know uh, what they are. The, there's a, uh, DNA polymerase called polymerase alpha that synthesizes the primers, the RNA primers that are going to be used. Those are shown in green. Uh, and then there are a variety of other proteins that form uh, a clamp on the DNA. So the replication occurs through the action of a clamp and those come in as well. And then there are two different DNA polymerases that extend uh, the molecule polymerase epsilon and delta, which is in another slide. So there are a variety of polymerases and cell proteins, and these are all brought here because L large T first bound the origin, and then all the other proteins are brought there as well. So eventually you get a, a larger uh, bubble. You have, again, you have leading strand synthesis and lagging strand sy synthesis in the opposite direction. All this occurs on the same molecule, uh, and this gets larger and larger. So here you see it's getting, getting larger and larger. Here's a leading strand. And, some la and a leading strand on here, and then uh, lagging strands. Here's one lagging strand on the top right here. So there are multiple polymerases uh, that are binding this uh, bubble. And then eventually the RNA primers are removed by an RNase, uh, and then molecules are filled in, and then ligated, and then you have a completely replicated DNA. So again, this is all catalyzed by large T antigen coming in and saying, this is an origin, I'm binding to it, and then all these other DNA replication proteins come and recognize it and start replicating these genomes. So this is what the replicating fork looks like. It's a really amazing machine. There are actually movies of this you can find uh, if you just search for DNA replication. Uh, and here is large, here's one, one end of the fork, if you will. We have large T, which is gonna keep unwinding. It moves along and unwinds the double strand. Here's leading strand synthesis. Uh, this is the one that's really easy to do. Here's the five prime end, and, and this is lagging strand synthesis over here. This has to form a loop because it goes in spurts. Really amazing machine. So that's SV40. It encodes one protein, T antigen, that, hap that causes all this to happen. All you need is one protein to bind the origin, and it starts. Now, as you're replicating these double stranded molecules, so being double stranded solves the end problem. Right, taking away that primer. But it introduces other problems, and one of them is that as you are making a replication bubble, you have bidirectional replication, this molecule gets twisted. So in order to unwind the double strand, in order to copy it, the rest of the molecule gets tied up in knots, and eventually that has to be released, and it's released by topoisomerases. So this overwound region gets cut, one strand gets cut, and that relaxes it so that the DNA replication can proceed. If you don't have topoisomerases, at some point replication will stop because this molecule is completely twisted up and the polymerase can't move into it and it can't be made single-stranded. All right, so that's one step. You have to relax the overwound region. And the other part is at the end when you've replicated the entire molecule, so now we have uh, we have the two blue strands, which were the original DNA, and then two colors of red. So this is semi-conservative replication. The original two strands were separated and each one was copied. But because of the topology, what happens here is you basically have two circles linked together as in a chain. And that's no good. You don't want them to be linked. So they have to be cut. And one of them has to be cut entirely, both strands. That's done by topo2. Uh, this requires energy, and that allows one circle to move out, and then it's ligated back together again. Okay, so you, these are cellular enzymes that uh, carry out this function 
for SV40. The SV40 genome is a circular double-stranded DNA. Which statement about its replication is correct? One, viral T <laughs> antigen binds and unwinds the ORI. Two, replication is bidirectional from a single ORI. Three, the five prime end problem is solved. Four, it has leading and lagging strand synthesis. And five, all of the above. All right. Hey, 100%, look at that. I guess you're ready for the exam, right? Okay, let's talk next about these parvoviruses which have a single-stranded genome with these funny structures at the end. They're at both ends, and they're actually formed, as shown on the bottom here, they're T structures formed by complementarity within the genome. So here, and that forms a primer, basically. So this, the DNA is self-complementary, and that gives you a primer for DNA synthesis. So this is going to be the primer for DNA polymerase. Now, these are also small viral genomes. They don't encode their own polymerase, but they do encode uh, a protein that is going to get DNA synthesis started. And here's how that works. So here's the genome, as I've been showing you here. Uh, the T here at the left has a three prime end, so it serves as a primer for DNA replication. And again, this is a host polymerase that is engaged here. And the red strand is the newly synthesized strand. So now we have a double-stranded product. We have to elongate this, this T part here, otherwise we're going to lose it. And so there, a sequence-specific nick occurs in this left-handed region. And this is done by one of the viral proteins that's made, Rep. 7868. So again, this DNA uh, has to get in the nucleus and a protein has to be made from it. This protein um, nicks this and then it allows the polymerase to fill in the other side, which is the red on the next step here, step four. All right, so the yellow ball shows the protein nicking it. The polymerase then uses the three prime end of the blue bottom strand as a primer fills in, and now you have a completely double-stranded molecule. You haven't lost any sequence at any end. The ends then form hairpins. We're showing it on the left here. These are the same hairpins that are formed in the beginning when the DNA comes in the cell. All right, so that double-stranded molecule forms a hairpin, and now we can use the three prime end of that new red hairpin to start initiating another round of DNA synthesis. So that's shown in light red. Uh, that, that strand displacement. Uh, and now we have the displaced strand, which is a little blue and a lot red. So that was the first strand that we made uh, back up here. Uh, and then we have a newly synthesized light red strand, which is a duplex molecule. And that just cycles back up here, gets nicked, uh, and um, goes through the whole process. Now before DNA replication can happen, you have to have a protein made from this genome you have to have the Rep7868 protein. Uh, and this is required for initiation and also for resolution uh, of the process. It's a helicase. It binds the five prime end uh, of the genome, and it, it causes this nick to happen. So how does this happen? If, how can we make this protein if we don't have double-stranded DNA? Well, the idea is that uh, this DNA is, is probably made double-stranded by DNA repair enzymes in the cell. And those, of course, include polymerases. Then that can be transcribed, make an mRNA. So before DNA replication occurs, uh, you can make a message to synthesize this protein. So it's not considered DNA replication it, that makes it initially double-stranded. It's considered DNA repair. All right, so this is continuous uh, replication. It doesn't need that polymerase alpha that synthesizes RNA primers for SV40 because it uses its three prime uh, end of this hairpin to prime DNA replication. As I said, it makes a protein uh, to, to enhance this process. And it's, it's all by strand displacement, which I think you can see is illustrated quite clearly here. There's no replication fork, there's no RNA primers, strand displacement. Okay, now let's move on to double-stranded DNA viruses. And the first one we'll talk about is adenovirus, double-stranded DNA, about 36,000 bases of double-stranded DNA. And these are the interesting virus particles with the Sputnik-like appearance. There is an origin of replication at both ends. By the way, I forgot to tell you where the uh, origin of replication of 
parvoviruses, but of course it's right there at that three prime end. That's where DNA synthesis begins. The origin of replication of adenoviruses at either end. The replication is by strand displacement, so no RNA primers. And of course, it's semi-conservative like uh, all the other mechanisms we're talking about. So let's see how this works. Primer for adenovirus DNA replication is a protein-linked primer made by the viral polymerase. So the virus encodes a DNA polymerase, and that's shown in the purple sphere here. Uh, it is initially linked to a protein called PTP, which means pre-terminal protein, and that's the protein that's going to be used as a primer. The polymerase adds a C residue, a single C to the pre-TP, and this is the primer for DNA replication. This protein linked to a single C molecule, and that starts at the three prime end of the genome, which is shown in the overview here and on the left in some detail. So the C hybridizes with the first G primer, and then the polymerase begins to make the first complementary strand that's shown here in step two in red by strand displacement. Right? So the primer is this single C residue at the very end of the genome. As the strand, as the other strand is displaced, a viral a single stranded DNA binding protein binds to it to keep it single stranded. And then eventually the whole genome is copied. And what you have then is a, a new double stranded DNA with a, a red product. That's the product of this synthesis. And that can enter the same cycle. It can then go up here and be primed again at the three prime end and make more DNA. But of course, you have to replicate the other strand as well because this is semi-conservative replication. So that displaced strand, which is now all bound up by DNA binding protein, is shown here in step four. The genome at its ends has inverted terminal repeats. So what that means is that any strand, any single strand of the genome, will form a structure such as this. It forms a duplex uh, structure at the end. Even though there's a circular DNA here, it forms a duplex structure. And the polymerase will recognize that as a place to begin initiation. Wouldn't recognize a single strand, but it recognizes a duplex as it does on the viral DNA. It will do it down here as well. So the polymerase will recognize this three prime end and begin copying it as well and you then makes a duplex from the other strand. So this way, both strands are copied, semi-conservative replication. Uh, as you can see, there's no end problem here because we don't use an RNA primer. We start at exactly the last base. Apparently, having a protein linked to one base is enough to get priming. And that remains there. That C, of course, is DNA, so you never have to remove it, so you don't have any end problem. So for parvovirus previously, the end problem was solved by having the virus prime itself, have that terminal hairpin serve as a primer. Here the end problem is solved by having a protein-linked primer initiate at the very last base of the genome, DNA synthesis. And again, it's not an RNA primer, so there's no end problem. Just to show you, since it's snowing and so cold, I wanted to show you a snow plow. And that's what this... Um, adenoviral single-stranded DNA binding protein looks like. So as the polymerase is, is uh, moving along here, copying the viral DNA, it's displacing the top strand, right? So here's the bottom strand. It's making a red copy of the bottom strand. It's displacing the top strand. The single-stranded binding protein comes in and binds it to keep it single-stranded. And also its shape is plow-shaped, and that helps to denature the duplex as the polymerase is moving down here as well. So this is a viral DNA polymerase. Um, the, the DNA binding protein is viral. All these things have to be synthesized. The priming protein has to be synthesized. That's why there's a cascade regulation in adenovirus replication, because you want to make those proteins first uh, before you can get DNA replication. Right, how is DNA replication of parvovirus and adenovirus similar? They both require protein-linked primers. Replication occurs by strand displacement. DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. A replication of fork occurs in both or none of the above. So how are they similar? Okay, so 62% of you answered correctly. B, replication occurs by strand <coughs> displacement. Only adenovirus requires a protein primer. 
not parvovirus. Uh, DNA synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm is not correct for either of these. Only pox viruses are going to do that. We haven't talked about those yet. Uh, a replication fork does not occur. Remember, replication forks only happen when you have RNA primers, and we don't have any RNA primers used here. All right, now bigger virus, herpes simplex virus. As we get bigger and bigger, we're encoding more and more proteins. We start with SV40, that encodes one. We move through adeno, which encoded more, and now herpes even more. Herpes encodes uh, a DNA polymerase. This is a list of the proteins that the virus encodes that are involved in DNA synthesis. You don't need to know these, but I'm just telling you be, to give you the sense that we're getting more complicated. DNA polymerase, single-stranded DNA binding protein. We saw how that works for adenovirus. An origin binding protein like T antigen to get things started. A processivity protein that helps you make long DNA. And a primase, it's going to synthesize primers. So this is a longer double-stranded DNA. It is linear like adenovirus DNA, but it is substantially longer. And remember, these are viruses where the DNA genome is in an icosahedral capsid, which is in turn in an envelope. And this uh, virus is unusual. It's got three origins of replication. We had one with SV40, we had two with adenovirus, and here we have three with herpes virus. So two of the same Ori S and one unique Ori L. The way this virus gets around the end problem is to do what we call rolling circle replication. Now, because um, it has a primase here, you might guess that it's using RNA primers, and you'd be right. So we have to figure out how to get rid of the primers without losing sequence. And the way this happens is by converting the linear genome when it gets into a cell into a circle, and then that replicates. Uh, so let's take a look at this process. So here's the linear double-stranded DNA genome. So the virus enters the cell. Where does this genome go, do you think, to replicate? It goes to the nucleus. You, you wouldn't be wrong for every virus except pox viruses, okay? It goes to the nucleus. There, it is ligated to form a circle by cellular enzymes because the virus, of course, hadn't made anything yet, so it would have to be a cellular enzyme that's doing the ligation. So it, it circularizes it, and then the origins uh, are recognized and re replication can begin. But of course, the virus has to make the proteins first before it can replicate, because it's got its own DNA polymerase and all those other proteins that I showed you. So this DNA has to be transcribed, and the mRNAs have to go out, proteins made, they have, those proteins have to get back in the nucleus. All right, so a lot has to happen. So this is rolling circle replication. So we have a double-stranded DNA, and that's what we've made of the incoming linear herpes virus genome. Circle here, it gets nicked. And then the polymerase recognizes the three prime hydroxyl and begins to make a complementary strand. And that's shown in red. So we have uh, the polymerase moving around the circle. It's displacing one strand, of course. And then the, the red is continuing, continuous DNA synthesis. And eventually, this displaced strand gets longer and longer as this new molecule goes around the circle. Uh, so you have to replicate that one as well, the displaced strand, because again, this is semi-conservative replication. Both strands have to be replicated. And that has to be done by discontinuous synthesis, because it's in the wrong direction for the polymerase to be able to go simply in this way, right? It has to go in that direction. It can only move in short pieces as the single strand is produced from the double-stranded circle. So these are primed with RNA, as you can see in the green. The polymerase recognizes uh, the RNA primer and fills it in. And then eventually the RNAs are removed and the sequence is replaced with DNA and then all the ends are ligated together. So there isn't any end problem. The end problem here is solved by having what we call a concatamer. Multiple genome equivalents are all ligated together by the nature of this rolling circle. It simply means that you make, this goes on and on and on. You make very long multiple genome length units. And so the polymerase can simply fill in any ends that may have gaps in them. So a rolling circle helps you get around the end problem.
Now you may ask, how does it cut it into unit pieces? Well, that happens during packaging. So these are then threaded into a capsid through the portal. And then when the whole genome is in, there's a signal for that, which we'll talk about in a bit. And the genome is cleaved at the right place. So you only have the right amount going into the capsid. So the solution to the end problem here is to have these very long concatamers uh, and allow the polymerase to fill in the RNA. Okay, so those are some really neat solutions to end problems. Here's pox virus, which is the biggest virus that we talk about in any detail. Uh, these have very large genomes, which again have terminal loops. They are ligated. The five and three prime ends are covalently attached. And so that presents an interesting problem for replication as well. We've dealt with double-stranded DNAs in two ways, with adenovirus, with N priming, with a protein, herpes by circularization. What are we going to do with this, this molecule? So the pox viruses replicate in the cytoplasm. They encode almost everything that they need to do everything in the cytoplasm. They make their own messenger RNAs in the cytoplasm. They cap them there. They process them there. Uh, they make new genomes and new particles in the cytoplasm. But they do encode a lot of proteins required for DNA synthesis, but not everything. And in the version of the slide I gave you, statement DNA synthesis is independent of cell proteins. And I'm taking that out because that simply isn't true. Because as, as I told you earlier, no virus encodes everything it needs. The pox viruses encode a lot of the enzymes needed to make the triphosphate precursors, but not all of them. So it's not independent uh, of the cell. It makes a lot of proteins, more than any virus we know about, but it's not independent. So let's see how this works. So here's an experiment showing you where uh, the DNA of this virus is replicating. And on the left is an infected cell. It's a single cell infected with pox virus after so many hours replication. And it's stained with a stain that turns blue when it binds to DNA. So you can see the cell nucleus is very blue, of course. But you can see also the cytoplasm has lots of blue areas. And you can see they occur in foci, very discrete foci. We call these factories. These are uh, foci where the virus is actively making new particles. It's doing everything it needs to do, transcription, DNA synthesis, and assembly. In the middle is a stain for the viral DNA binding protein. So the single-stranded DNA binding protein, similar to the one I showed you for adenovirus. Uh, this is a viral, a vaccinivirus protein. So you see it's only staining in the cytoplasm. It's not staining in the nucleus. And in fact, it's staining the same, the same dots as in the first slide. And you can see on the third image is a merge of the first two colors. So it's blue plus red, which would give you kind of a cyan or magenta color. Uh, and you can see that the DNA binding protein is together with the viral DNA in the cytoplasm. So I, that's the factories in the cytoplasm where this virus is replicating its genome and making particles. And here's how uh, the, gene, the genome replicates. So again, it's this very weird double-stranded structure where the ends are joined, and it has inverted terminal repeats at each end, which allow for this complementarity. So the first step that has to happen is this double-stranded DNA is nicked at the left end uh, between the D and the E sequences. So you can see the, the complementary regions on this double-stranded DNA. Uh, the nick occurs here, and then the three prime end of the nick three prime hydroxyl is used as a primer for DNA replication. And so the polymerase then copies to the end of the molecule and giving you that red sequence there. That sequence can now fold up. You've basically duplicated this end terminal hairpin, if you will. It can now fold up and give you another uh, three prime end on the big D. And that serves as a primer for DNA polymerase. And we're gonna extend on that. Here, you can see it extending. Uh, and eventually it extends all the way on the bottom strand, then turns around, goes around the loop, and copies the, st the top strand. So it does all of this at the same time. All right, and now you have a, basically a double length molecule. Uh, and then this is nicked at this right hand circle, uh, and then the two strands separate. So there's no end problem again because the viral polymerase is using the three prime end uh, of the viral genome generated by a nick uh, 
as a primer. So there's no RNA primer, there's no loss of sequence. So this is very similar to the parvovirus strategy, except starting uh, from a double-stranded DNA genome. And again, all this happens in the cytoplasm. So the virus encodes at least 15 proteins involved in DNA synthesis besides the polymerase, uh, the topoisomerases, DNA binding proteins, even a few enzymes of nucleoside metabolism, but not all of them. It depends on the host cell to supply some of the triphosphates, so it's not entirely depend independent of the host cell. So our last question uh, deals with pox virus. What makes pox virus DNA replication different from all the other viruses we discussed today? One, the complete replication machinery is encoded by the viral genome. Uh, two, DNA synthesis occurs in the nucleus. Three, DNA synthesis occurs by strand displacement. Four, none of the above. Very good. 92% got none of the above. The complete replication machinery is encoded by the genome. I, I think I tried to emphasize to you uh, quite a bit that it's not by any virus, even though this has the most of any virus we talked about. It doesn't have everything. It doesn't occur in the nucleus, right? strand displacement, that doesn't make it different from uh, other viruses. It's really, it's really none of these. We've talked a lot about starting replication of DNA synthesis at, at viral origins of replication. I want to talk about these a little bit because these are obviously very important. We have origins in our chromosomes as well. We have lots of them per chromosome because you know, our chromosomes are long, so you need lots of beginnings of DNA synthesis in order to complete them in a, in a reasonable amount of time. But viruses can have one or a couple. Uh, we've talked about them in the SV40 genome, uh, the single origin up there. We talked about them in the parvovirus genome. There's a single origin uh, at the left at three prime end there. There's an origin at each end of adenovirus genome, and then there are three in the herpes virus genome. All this means is this is where DNA synthesis initiates and we call it an origin of replication. These tend to be, and I want to look, look a little bit about the sequence of an origin and what it does. They tend to be AT-rich segments, and as you remember from what we've talked about just today, they're recognized by viral origin recognition proteins, and the function of that is to get the DNA machinery, whether it be viral or host, attracted to that sequence to get DNA replication started. So they seed assembly of multi-protein complexes, and viral genomes can have different numbers of origins. And because SV40 had just one, this made it really easy to study uh, DNA replication for many, many years because it would, it's really hard to identify origins in chromosomal DNA. So here are schematics of three uh, origins. Uh, SV40 uh, on the top, herpes simplex virus uh, in the middle, and adenovirus at the bottom. And some of the features of these origins are, are shown on the slide. So the yellow parts are the sequences that are bound by the origin recognition protein or the origin binding protein. You can see they all uh, have such sequences. On the top, SV40, the yellow is where large T binds. Remember, large T is the origin binding protein. They're kind of dispersed. Uh, the herpes simplex has a similar uh, site for its origin binding protein, and here the adenovirus origin binding protein binds at the left end. They also have AT rich sequences so that you can melt them more easily, right? AT rich AT sequences form less strong double bonds than GC. So remember, the origin binding protein is going to get in there and melt it so the polymerase can come in and start copying. So you put AT rich sequences near them. And then they also tend to have nearby binding sites for transcriptional regulators and promoters in some cases. So you can see uh, on the top here there are some binding sites for transcription protein SP1. And not too far away is the transcriptional uh, promoters on either side of this SV40 origin. Here are some viral promoters on either side of the herpes virus origin. And here are some binding sites for uh, different transcriptional regulators here as well. So I think in terms of genetic economy, these sequences tend to cluster the transcriptional regulatory sites and the, uh, the sites for binding of origin binding proteins. So these proteins we've talked about, I just want to review some of the properties. We talked about 
uh, polyoma T, this is SV40 T antigen, it binds specifically to DNA. The papillomaviruses, which we'll talk about in a moment, they have a similar protein called E1, but by itself, it doesn't bind to DNA, it needs another viral protein. So here's an example of a simple virus that makes two origin binding proteins. We talked about the parvovirus, Rep6878 protein that unwinds, uh, that binds to the ends, and unwinds the DNA also involved in nicking. The origin binding protein for adenovirus is the preterminal protein together with the polymerase that binds the ends of the DNA. And then there's a, there's a herpes viral <coughs> protein as well uh, that binds. Now the point here is to tell you that this is an incredibly important process to bind these origins and get replication started. And the viruses are all using these uh, recognition, these ORI recognition proteins. And let's look at one of them in a little bit of detail, just to show you how complicated these proteins are. This is large T protein of SV40. You'll also see it referred to as large T antigen because when it was first discovered, it was by virtue of antibodies recognizing it in infected cells. We didn't know what it was doing, so it was simply called T antigen, and the name has stuck. So here's the linear sequence of large T antigen. You can see it's about 700 amino acids long, and it has domains for all sorts of things. For example, here's part of the protein that binds uh, the origin right here. This part of the protein in, in the light color uh, binds polymerase alpha. That's the polymerase that makes the, the RNA primers. Uh, part of the protein is an ATPase. This protein can unwind DNA. That's an energy dependent process. You need to hydrolyze ATP. Um, and it can also bind a protein called retinoblastoma protein. And we'll talk about that significance of that in a moment. Here's a nuclear localization signal, which is important because this protein has to get in the nucleus to bind SV40 DNA. Because remember, it's made in the cytoplasm, as all proteins are, but its job is in the nucleus, so it needs to have a nuclear localization signal. Now, T antigen is important for regulating the kind of animal that is infected by the virus. So SV40 won't infect every animal. It has a very restricted species tropism. And the tropism is controlled uh, by T antigen because in the wrong species, so the species for SV40 is the monkey, in the wrong species, like a mouse, for example, it will, the T antigen will not interact with the polymerase alpha, which is essential for making the RNA primers. So that simple fact, the sequence here is not the right sequence to bind, say, a mouse polymerase alpha, restricts the tropism of this virus. This protein also binds what we call cell cycle regulators. So the retinoblastoma protein, RB, is a cell cycle regulator, and T antigen binds to it. That binding causes the cell to go into S phase. And this is very important because the virus uh, requires an actively replicating cell in order to access its DNA replication machinery. And to do that, it utilizes T antigen. And we're gonna talk about that now. So most of your cells are not really dividing. Uh, or if they do divide, they, they divide rarely. And of course, we have one extreme neurons which don't ever divide. And then we have cells lining your epithelial surfaces, say your gut, are lined with the mucosal epithelium. Those cells are always dividing, and they turn over every three days or so. But most of the other cells in your body, contrary to what you may think, are not dividing. They're quiescent. Viruses don't like quiescent cells because a quiescent cell, a non-dividing cell, is not undergoing DNA replication. So if SV40 requires host cell DNA polymerase and all the ancillary proteins, they're not going to be available in a quiescent cell. So what has happened, and we have learned this over the years, is that viruses have to induce the cells to divide. They have to get them out of quiescence. They have to wake them up. And this is done, as you might guess, by either an immediate early or a very early gene product. Because remember, these have to, this has to happen in order for DNA replication to occur. So SV40T antigen is an example of that. There are also uh, proteins in adenoviruses and papillomaviruses that kick the cells into dividing. 
viruses will not replicate in quiescent cells. Now let me show you uh, a little bit about how this happens. Here's our cell cycle, which all of you should know, right? Here's on top is mitosis, which happens in a very small part of the cell cycle. For the cell cycle, which is roughly, say, 24 hours, depending on the cell type. Let's say the cells have just divided. They then have to grow, get bigger. Otherwise, if they don't grow, they're going to just get smaller and smaller when they divide, right? So they grow in a phase called G1. Then they make new DNA. They replicate their DNA using some of the mechanisms we talked about here. Uh, and then they divide. In the cell cycle, there are a couple of what we call restriction or checkpoints. And we're going to talk about those later on when we talk about transformation and oncogenesis. But here, we're going to look at one in the G1 phase, which is mediated by the RB protein. And this is here to keep cells from dividing, because they don't need to divide. Until the conditions are right, the cells don't need to divide. And RB is the gatekeeper of the cell cycle. So this is encoded by a, a gene called retinoblastoma, or RB, because it was first identified in kids with tumors of the retina, pretty rare tumor, but this gene was mutated in those tumors. And as I've said, this protein controls entry into the S phase. So this protein is standing here and keeping the cells in G1, preventing them from making DNA. It is a tumor suppressor gene because if you lose it by mutation, you get a tumor. Uh, and we'll talk later about why that is. But this is a target of many viruses who need to kick the cell into mitosis. They inactivate the RB protein and make the cells go through this G1 and into S. They want cells to be in S. They want cells to be making DNA, right? Because they want, for SV40, they want the polymerase, the primase, all those other proteins. They want them, and they, they're only going to be made during DNA synthesis. So a resting cell is not going to make all of these proteins that are needed for DNA synthesis. That would be a waste. So all these proteins that are needed for cell division are controlled by promoters because they're encoded in DNA and you have to make messenger RNAs encoding polymerase and primase, and topoisomerase, et cetera. And those promoters are controlled by two transcription factors called E2F and DP. So these transcription factors bind uh, in the promoter region. You get transcription of genes involved in DNA synthesis. Cells make DNA and then they divide. The retinoblastoma protein, the way it is, acts as a checkpoint is to bind up these transcription factors. So here's retinoblastoma protein in uh, mustard color, I guess. And it is bound to uh, these E2F and DP. And that prevents them from activating the genes needed for DNA synthesis. Now in the cell, we have mechanisms for releasing the RB checkpoint, because we don't want our cells to be quiescent all the time, right? There may be conditions where a certain tissue needs to multiply. If you're doing a lot of exercise and your muscles need to get bigger, your muscle cells have to divide. So you're, you're eating a lot of protein, and that signals uh, a number of protein kinases to phosphorylate RB, and that, po that pops it off of the transcription proteins and then they can activate DNA synthesis. So phosphorylated RB doesn't bind the transcription proteins that are needed for DNA replication. So this is a normal cell control. And if you have a deletion in the RB, you develop a tumor because your retinal cells keep dividing, they don't stop, and that's the beginning of a tumor. So viruses like SV40, uh, the papillomaviruses and adenoviruses, they make a very early protein, the T antigen in the terms, of, in the case of SV40, uh, for adenovirus is called E1A. This is an early uh, protein, and the human papillomavirus is early proteins as well. These early proteins bind RB. So these viral proteins are schematized here in purple. They bind RB. They prevent RB from inactivating these cellular transcription factors, and that's how they kick the cells into mitosis. This is brilliant. This is an amazing strategy. T antigen, SV40 comes into a cell, its DNA goes in the nucleus, it makes T antigen. If the cell is quiescent, the T antigen is gonna bind retinoblastoma protein, the cell is gonna start dividing, and it makes all the DNA synthesis proteins, and the virus uses them. You can't love that, it's just amazing, right? It's just gorgeous, and 
this is why, as you will see, this is one of the reasons why SV40 causes tumors, because it makes cells divide. And adenovirus and the human papillomaviruses cause tumors, because they have these proteins that make cells divide uncontrollably. And we'll talk more about that later. So that's the strategy. The viruses get into a quiescent cell. They make an early protein like T antigen that inactivates RB and makes the cells divide so that they can replicate their genome. And this happens pretty much for a lot of these uh, small DNA viruses, even the bigger ones, if they need the nucleus. Pox viruses don't care about this because they make their own uh, DNA synthesis proteins in the cytoplasm. And I want to end up with one example of when this isn't always true, that the virus has to kick uh, the cells into mitosis in order to make more DNA. And that's human papillomaviruses, which cause uh, warts. There are many, many different types of human papillomaviruses. They can cause warts all over your body. And the ones that cause anogenital warts can lead to anogenital cancers. Um, and so they infect, uh, the, they can infect the skin or mucosal layers. And the skin, of course, is composed of many, many layers of cells of different type and the basal lamina underneath it. And here's a human papillomavirus DNA genome. It's very much like SV40, circular double-stranded DNA. These viruses initially infect the cells at the very bottom, the precursor skin cells. They get in by a, by a scratch or an abrasion of some kind and go into the very basal cells. The DNA gets in and it goes to the nucleus. And if these cells are quiescent, which they can be, the virus makes a protein that inactivates RB and gets the cells dividing so that it can make a lot of genomes, as you can see here. And then the virus, you know, these cells move upward. So they start at this, in, these, in these precursor layers. They move up. They differentiate until they're the most differentiated at the top. And then eventually your skin dies and it flakes <laughs> off, right? And those are the top layers of cells. And this happens continuously. The most differentiated cells at the top don't divide anymore. So your outermost layer, just beneath the dead layer, is no longer dividing. Yet, papillomaviruses, they move into, uh, into, up through this differentiation scheme. They end up in these highly differentiated cells at the surface. And there, they replicate like crazy, even though those cells are quiescent. Now, you're probably thinking, you just told me that the virus needs to make a cell divide in order to replicate. But here I'm telling you that in these non-replicating cells, you make thousands of copies of the viral <laughs> DNA uh, in the nucleus. The key is that apparently this virus has evolved to use the DNA damage response of the cell to make more DNA. All right, so DNA damage response of a cell, a series of proteins that we have in us, that detect mutations, double-strand breaks, mismatches uh, in, in double-stranded DNA and so forth. They detect the presence of papillomavirus and they respond by upregulating DNA synthesis enzymes. And that ends up replicating the genome. So there are always situations that are exceptions to these kinds of paradigms that I tell you. So uh, papillomaviruses have evolved to do this and they have to because what, what happens is these cells eventually die and flake off. And that's one way that these viruses are spread from one host to another when the, the outer layer flakes off and you, you encounter it in a room and, and you get infected again. And they do so, again, by not kicking the cells uh, into mitosis here, but by taking advantage of uh, DNA checkpoint, DNA repair. Now, these papillomaviruses, if you remember from the transcription lecture, these papillomaviruses make alternatively spliced mRNAs. And the splice that gives rise to the mRNA encoding the capsid protein only happens in these highly differentiated cells at the top. It's not found down here because apparently, as these cells differentiate, uh, they make proteins that allow that alternative splice to occur. And that makes perfect sense because you don't want to be assembling viruses until you get to the very top of the skin and you have an opportunity to spread to another host. So the virus has evolved to be able to multiply its DNA extensively in non-dividing cells and it can make the capsid protein to encapsidate the DNA uh, in these top cells by alternative splicing. 